Perfect. Well, thank you for coming out on a wintry night. Uh, there were elections just a couple weeks ago, as you know, uh, but they're still ongoing. Uh, they're still counting ballots in California. Uh, that's going to take a while yet. They're allowed to do that for another couple weeks. That's fine. Uh, there's also an election tonight in Mississippi. It's a Senate runoff to decide the last member of the U.S. Senate. So these things never quite end. Um, I thought when I started studying elections, you know, every couple years I'd be busy, uh, but it turns out to be a continual process. So we're going to have a look at election 2018, uh, focusing on Wisconsin, but with some attention to the national scene as well. I'll be showing you a lot of data from that election, at least as far as we have it to this point, and, um, and hopefully generate some questions to talk about at the end. So let me tell you about the agenda I have for tonight. Uh, three things I want to cover. Uh, one is the supposed blue wave that was supposed to take over mass politics uh, this November. What happened to that? Did it materialize? How do we know? Uh, second is about the remarkable voter turnout we saw in 2018. You're going to see that it just doesn't look like any other election on, on this metric. Uh, I suspect there's some interest in the governor's race here, so we'll talk about that a little bit. I know that my students were interested. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions about anything else. You want to talk about The Ohio State University in a nice way, that's fine. <laughs> if you'd like to talk about recounts or machines or what happened in Wisconsin uh, in other races, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so agenda item one, about that blue wave. Uh, everyone said this was coming. Uh, Scott Walker said this was coming. He tweeted as much back in January. Donald Trump said it was coming. Journalists said it was coming. The polling indicated that Democrats were more enthused and more likely to turn out and were agitated by what was happening in Washington and they would show up this fall and help the Dems out. Well, how does the set of losses that Republicans experienced this year sit relative to what we would have expected in a normal year? Is there really enough of a wave that it looks different from what you'd expect in a regular year? Well, why don't we start by thinking about the House of Representatives? This is where all 435 seats in our U.S. Congress were up. Uh, there is a phenomenon known as the midterm loss phenomenon. This says that the president's party almost always loses seats in midterm elections. It's, just a re it's as close to we what we have as a law in political science. That's the science part of political science is this. In fact, every midterm election, going back to the Civil War, except for three, saw the president's party lose seats. So I think we knew the day that Trump won uh, back in November 2016 that the Republicans would suffer in 2018, not because he was Trump in particular, though you're going to see there's a penalty for being Trump, but because he was an R. And an R in the White House means the R's are going to lose some seats in the midterm election. So why don't we look at what happens in the House? So this is the number of seats that the president's party loses or gains in the House from World War II until four years ago, the last midterm election. So you see two oddities there up at the top. Uh, those are two of the only three cases in the last 150 years where the President's Party gained seats. These are both unusual situations. This is 1998, which was Bill Clinton's second midterm, when his approval ratings were very high, in fact, and the impeachment process was not going well. Uh, and this is the first midterm after 9-11. This was George Bush's first midterm. So two <coughs> exceptions. You set those small ones aside. Every other midterm election, the President loses a couple dozen seats on average in the House of Representatives. So, that, so zero is not the baseline for judging 2018. It's the average of these years. There we are, 2018, still counting. Uh, another seat was announced for the Democrats just today. So we're at about a loss of 40 for the Republicans. So Democrats gained 40 seats. That's enough for them to be in the majority, obviously. It's a pretty good game. <coughs> it's not crazy unusual, though. It's just, it's a pretty good victory. You'd be, you'd be happy with that, right? It's not as big as the loss that Obama suffered back in 2010 in his first midterm election. His party lost 63 seats. That was exceptional. That was certainly a wave election in which the Tea Party came to office and really changed their party and changed Washington. Uh, it is bigger than some others. It's bigger than Obama's second loss. It's bigger than Bush's second midterm, but not quite exceptional. Now, I will say that the seats don't quite bear out the success that Democrats had in winning votes. There is not a perfect relationship between how many votes you win and how many seats you get for a variety of reasons that we're going to talk about. But by this metric, uh, not quite a wave. How about in the Senate? In the U.S. Senate, similar pattern. The President's party tends to lose seats. 
Not always, not as predictably, but that's in part because there aren't as many Senate seats up in any given year. There are only a third of the Senate seats at risk. Uh, the average over this time is something like four or five seats. This time, Republicans actually gained a couple. So it runs contrary to the pattern. Now you'll say, well, of course, the Democrats had a hard fight in the US Senate. Keep in mind that the seats that were up this year were ones that were first elected six years ago. Go back six years, that's 2012. That was a good year for the Democrats. And so lots of Democrats won in places that they might not have otherwise won, like Missouri and North Dakota and West Virginia, some very red states. And so they had to pay the price for that in 2018. There were 33 seats up. 24 of those, I think, were seats held by Democrats. 10 of those were Democrats in states that Trump won. And so they lost some of those. Right? So, okay, so maybe the map is working against the Democrats here. Just sort of bad luck that the set of seats that was up this year was not very friendly. Maybe the most hostile map Democrats have faced. How about governorships? Uh, similar pattern, one exception, uh, giving you the finger there in the middle, aside <laughs> from that one. Uh, in every other midterm year, the President's party loses seats in governor's elections. 2018 doesn't look exceptional. You wouldn't know there was anything special about this year. Republicans lost six <coughs> governor's seats, including the one in Wisconsin. Pretty normal. And this one can't be due to districts or any other mechanism. It's just states, which haven't changed. Um, so a modest, solid victory for the Democrats. It doesn't look quite like a wave to me. Uh, we don't have a definition, but this probably would not define it for me. One more place to look is in state legislatures. Most state legislatures have, if not all, many of their seats up in midterm years. Uh, President's party tends to lose seats in midterm elections, about 330 seats on average. Again, one or two exceptions there. We don't know the total this year uh, so far, but it looks like it's going to be under 300, actually less than the average. Okay, so again, bad year for Republicans but maybe not rising to the level of tidal wave or tsunami or mudslide or whatever your favorite analogy is. One more, and then we're gonna move off of these. This is the Wisconsin Assembly. All 99 seats are up uh, every two years. There isn't much change in the Assembly in most election years. It's one or two or three seats, much less than at the national level. This year it was one seat, one seat. So Democrats did very well statewide in Wisconsin, as we're gonna see shortly. Won the governor's race, US Senate race, three other statewide races. That success did not trickle down into the state legislature. It stopped immediately when it got to that part of the ballot. Again, we'll talk about why that is. Okay, so Democrats make some gains in state legislatures, uh, very small here in Wisconsin, but more success in other places. But I wanna put their gains this year in some perspective to give you a sense of what the larger environment looks like. So this is a graphic some of you may have seen. It was in the New York Times a week or two ago showing control of state legislatures from the 60s, that's the beginning of this graph, up until this year. Uh, these states at the bottom, these are all the two-letter abbreviations, those are supposed to be blue, those are controlled by Democrats. Up here, legislature is controlled by Republicans, and then the gray ones are split, so one chamber, one party, one chamber, the other. And you could see that for a long stretch of post-war history, Democrats controlled most states. Uh, they lost that control in two big steps. One is the 1994 midterm elections right here. You can see the big increase in the number of states held by Republicans and the, the number of losses that Democrats suffered. That sort of shifted things permanently in a way that Democrats haven't recovered from. Uh, and then there's another step here. Uh, later, sort of under Obama, you see the number of Democratic legislatures continue to decrease. So Democrats made gains. They're now, they've now got six more, six more legislatures where they control both chambers than they did before. Only one legislature actually had both chambers changed this year. Uh, there's only one left that has a split at all, that's Minnesota. But Republicans are still in charge most places. That's true of governorships and of the state legislature. So what the advantage that the Democrats got this year, very helpful, but what they're doing is clawing back small amounts of what they've lost over the last 20 years. Okay, and in particular, what they lost in the last 10 years. There's a price that an incumbent party pays for being in office. Uh, and political scientists sometimes call this the cost of governing. There's just a penalty that voters seem to exact on the sitting party for being the sitting party. 
And the longer that party is in office, the more of a penalty they tend to pay. So I want to give you some sense of what the Democrats had to pay in order to have Barack Obama in the White House for eight years. Remember, in that time, there would have been two midterm elections, a bunch of other you know, state and local elections. So uh, the receipt, the bill for the Democrats at the end of this eight years, almost 1,000 state legislative seats lost. Uh, a lot of state legislative chambers. There are 99 legislative chambers, if you consider upper and lower, so they lost a third of those. A dozen governorships flip, 60-some House seats in the end, and about 11 Senate seats, which is easily enough to control the Senate. Right? So Obama did lots of good things for Democrats. There are a lot of legislative achievements Democrats would proudly point to. There are a lot of penalties to pay as a result of being in office as well. And the penalties for Obama turn out to be bigger than for most other presidents who serve two terms. All two-term presidents would have a receipt like this at the end of the day. Things lost. But the losses are bigger under Obama than any president at least going back to FDR. Not sure about before that. Why is that, you say? Why would this president <coughs> suffer more losses in these various places while he's in office than other presidents? <coughs> Well, some of it turns out to be that he's a Democrat. It, there's just more of a price to pay for being a Democrat. Let me give you some evidence of that. This is also from the, basically the post-World War II era. So when the, part, when the president is a Democrat, he tends to lose closer to 400 seats in state legislatures, whereas a Republican would only lose about 300. Slightly more governorships, slightly more, about 10 more House seats and a couple more Senate seats. And this imbalance is true even if you add in 2018, which I've not done here. But even putting that in, where Republicans had pretty big losses this year, still Democrats tend to suffer more. We don't quite know why this is. Uh, one theory is that Democrats actually promise to do things with government when they run for office. They view government as an instrument of good. And so they set expectations for what will happen. And those expectations are almost never met. And so voters become disillusioned and they pay a bigger price. Republicans don't often make promises about using government for good, and so there's just less on them in a way when they come to office. So that's one possible explanation, but the truth is we don't quite know why this happens, but it's a, it's a regularity, at least in modern politics. Okay, so that's 2018 in terms of losses. Um, it hurts if you're a Republican this year, but not as much as it could have, particularly given what we thought uh, Trump might do to the electorate. And, uh, and relative to the price you might pay if you were a Democrat in the White House rather than a Republican. Now, some of the limited effect that Democrats had this year has to do with legislative districts being the means by which we choose people for office. Right? We can't say that about governorships, but the modest gains that Democrats made this year in the U.S. House, in the Wisconsin Assembly, in the Wisconsin State Senate, which also had basically no change, we think might have something to do with Districting. Now let's think about the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House as a nice contrast. Talked about the Senate already. The seats that are up this year were ones that were first up or last up in 2012. Uh, most of those are seats held by Democrats. Political scientists refer to this as exposure. How exposed is a party when the election rolls around? How many seats do they have to defend? Democrats were highly exposed in the U.S. Senate. They had to defend a couple of dozen seats. Uh, I said it was 24 before, that's right. Turns out there were two extra seats that were tacked on this year because of special elections, so the total is 26. That's a lot. So to make gains in the Senate, Democrats would have to hold all of those, not lose a single one of them, including the 10 in the Trump states, and then go find a couple more. <laughs> that's extremely challenging. So you might say, okay, that's fine. Democrats had a tough time this year. We'll take the, you know, the split decision in the Senate and call it a day. House is probably a different story. Why do Democrats face a disadvantage in, this, in the House? Well, there are two things going on, one of which you probably thought about a lot and have feelings about, and the other one you may not have thought about as much, but turns out to be just as or maybe more important. So let's start with the latter one. I'm going to call this gerrymandering after Elbridge Gerry. He's the, the name given to that phenomenon, former governor, vice president. Uh, gerrymandering, as you know, is the process of the party in power drawing legislative district lines in a way to favor their party and disadvantage the other party. Republicans in Wisconsin did that in 2011 because they were in control of the process. And in fact, Republicans in many states did that because they were in control in many states in 2011, as you just saw from the graphic a moment ago. 
And so they've drawn those districts in a way to pack Democrats into a small number of districts where they have far more votes than they need to win and to spread out their supporters in a more efficient manner to win lots of districts with reasonable margins, but not excessive ones. So it's a, a, a kind, of, kind of an efficiency that's built into that process. So that's part of it. That's dampening the effect of de votes for Democrats turning into seats for Democrats. So it's, it's fine to be upset about that. <laughs> I think this is a, a bad thing for democracy. We ought to fix it. And now about a dozen states have pretty good fixes for it that take it out of the control of the state legislature's hands. But there's something else going on that Republicans and no one else really caused, and that's that Democratic voters have concentrated themselves in a small number of urban areas around this country, increasingly concentrated in cities. To the degree that in some cities, the vote for the Democratic candidate will be 75, 80, 80 85%. You see that in smaller cities like Madison. You certainly see it in bigger cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, and Dallas. I can't think of a big city today in the United States that has a Republican mayor. 20 years ago, I could have named some for you. New York or LA, there were, they existed. They're gone. And those cities have become bluer and bluer. Well, what Democrats have done to themselves is make it hard to translate their support for their party into seats because they've compacted themselves into these dense urban areas that become difficult to represent with districts. Almost anyone drawing districts, in fact, Democrats drawing districts, can barely get themselves back to where they should be by trying to carve up their own voters <laughs> to create districts. Take the case of Illinois, a Democratic state with a big Democratic city. Democrats drew the district lines there. They worked pretty hard just to get themselves equal representation. Right? So now you've got these two things together, hence the plus between them. You have the natural concentration of Democrats in urban areas, Republicans much more evenly distributed in suburbs and rural communities. Then Republicans get to draw the maps on top of that. Right? There's an additional bonus from that. So those two things together are going to make it very hard for Democrats to get the number of seats they should, given the amount of votes they won. One piece of evidence for this, Trump in 2016 lost the popular vote by about two percentage points to Hillary Clinton. She got more votes than he did. But there are 435 House districts. If you count up the districts he won, he won more of them. He won 235. She won 205. Okay, so there's a candidate winning less of the vote nationwide, but taking 30 more seats. So if we just replicated that in 2018, if that was the vote for the House candidates this year, Republicans would get 235 seats, even losing the popular vote. Okay, so it's kind of amazing, actually, that Democrats were able to eke out for a gain of 40 seats, given those structural disadvantages. And by the way, the few places where Democrats picked up a lot of seats, the states where they had a lot of success, places like Pennsylvania and California, were places where the partisans in the legislature didn't get to draw the districts. In California, there's a Citizens Commission that draws the districts. Democrats had a ton of success there. They just won another seat today. They keep, they keep, they keep it happening there. In Pennsylvania, the districts were struck down by the state Supreme Court and redrawn by an impartial expert. Okay, so when the, when the playing ground is fairer, you're going to see that blue wave turn into seats more readily. Uh, it just is not the case in most states the way it is in Pennsylvania and California. A little more evidence on this. This relationship between votes earned and seats gained. So what I'm going to show you here is a scatter plot showing this is all the same elections from World War II till today, all the House elections. Each dot is a year. So along here you have how much of the vote the Democrats won if you add up all the candidates who ran in that year. So 50-50 would be a tied election. And here's how many seats they won in the House of Representatives as a result of that election. This is the magic number. 218 gets you a majority in the House of Representatives out of 435. So here's the nice thing. As you win more seats, as you, as you win more votes, you get more seats. That's how it should be. It's not a perfect relationship. It's not proportional representation. We're not Europe, after all. But there's a relationship. It's pretty steep. So up here are places where Democrats won a lot of votes, and they won a lot of seats. Down here are some more recent elections where Republicans did better, and they won a majority of the seats. Where is 2018 in this graph, you ask? There we are kind of out of line with the rest of the dots. Maybe you wouldn't have detected it if I didn't tell you. But here we have what looks like a blue wave. Democrats are won something like 54 or 55% of the two-party vote. It's pretty good. Here are a bunch of other elections where they won 54 or 55% of the vote. And they got 260 or 270, 280 seats. 
this year they're going to end up with 234 seats or something like that. So something is clearly different. These are elections that happened under <coughs> old maps and before cities became as democratic as they are today. Uh, there's also this funny one right here I didn't label. Uh, it's funny because Democrats won more of the vote, but Republicans got more of the seats. That's 2012. That was the first election after the maps went into place. Okay, so there definitely is a structural disadvantage for Democrats today, partly not their doing, uh, not the doing of any politician, but some of it clearly the doing of Republicans who are in charge. Let me give you some more evidence about how the maps matter in Wisconsin in particular. Uh, as you may know, there's a, a case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court last year called Gil v. Whitford. I was not an expert witness in that case, but I pretty closely followed it and was involved with some of the plaintiffs and the action that was happening there. That case got set aside by the Supreme Court based on standing rules, and it's now going to be relitigated here in Wisconsin and hopefully taken back to the Supreme Court. Here's the main evidence that came forward in the case, and this comes from graphics from the New York Times in a Sunday Magazine they, piece they did about this. So let's go back to legislative elections in Wisconsin before the current maps were put in place by Republicans in 2011. So here are the 2008 elections. You remember Barack Obama was running for president for the first time that year, won Wisconsin easily. It's a good year for the Democrats. And that trickled right down to the state legislature where if you add up all the votes, one for all 99 seats around the state, Democrats won about 56% of the vote, right, as it should be. And they won a majority of the seats in the legislature, 52 out of 99. So not very different from their vote. A little bit less, but they didn't quite get their share, but things look pretty normal. New maps get created in 2011. Next election's 2012. Another good year for the Democrats. Barack Obama's on the ballot again. He wins Wisconsin, not quite as easily, but he and Tammy Baldwin both win that year. Democrats get about the same share of the vote they did four years earlier, 53% of all the assembly votes. Now they only get 39 seats. Now it's true, Democrats are creeping into big cities, and that causes a disadvantage. They didn't creep that fast. <laughs> this is a four-year period. The population just didn't shift quickly enough to account for this. This is clearly something to do with new lines being drawn in between the first and the second. And those lines are so effective that they're durable even four years after that. So we'll move ahead to 2016, not as good a year for Democrats. Trump is now the candidate at the top of the ticket. Republicans win the state. Democrats don't win a majority of the vote, but now they, get, they still get penalized in assembly seats only getting 35. And today they sit at about 33. Okay, so pretty good evidence here that redistricting matters. I'd be happy to talk about redistricting all night if you want. Uh, we, I'm happy to take more questions in the Q&A, but I just put this here as the first part of our agenda to have in mind as we think about the blue wave. It probably didn't materialize quite the way that many of us were expecting, but part of that not materializing is that there are some disadvantages that Democrats face that if Republicans had switched, switched places with them would not have faced. So that's agenda item one. Uh, let's go to two, which is about voter turnout. Voter turnout. Pretty remarkable year in 2018. These are turnout rates in national elections, both presidential and midterm elections like the one that happened this year for the last century or so. So a lot of variability. Some elections are more interesting and draw out more people, some less so. There are some regularities, though. Uh, one is that turnout in presidential elections is always higher. Right? It's not surprising. Kind of the average here is about 60% in a presidential race. So about six out of 10 people cast ballots who are eligible. Midterm elections are a little more variable, but maybe 40% on average, so about a 20-point gap. But look what happens in 2018. Again, we're still counting ballots, but it looks like turnout was about 116 million votes, the most ever in a midterm election. 49% turnout, so about half of the electorate participating. That would be the highest turnout rate in a midterm election since, it beats this one, which is 1966, since 1914. So highest turnout in a midterm election in a century. 1914, I'll just point out, was before women had the right to vote, before 18-year-olds had the right to vote by a long time, before U.S. senators were directly elected or just at the time that was happening. This was a different political world. That comparison almost does not seem fair. In the modern era, this month's elections were certainly the highest turnout we have seen. Really tremendous. And it turns out that that was more tremendous in Wisconsin than in other parts of the country. 
So here and now is turnout in Wisconsin, just for the last 30 years or so, for which we have data. Wisconsin, as you don't, if you don't know, tends to be one of the higher turnout states, often in the top five for turnout rates. Uh, that was true this year as well. So our presidential turnout tends to be more like 70% rather than 60. But look what's been happening to midterm turnout here. It actually has been increasing for the past 25 years or so, going up, approaching the turnout rate in a presidential election. And that is not what is happening in the rest of the country. So here is U.S. midterm turnout, and here's the same line I just showed you, Wisconsin turnout going up, up, up over the last couple of decades. What is going on? Well, uh, one thing that's going on is Wisconsin has interesting elections that draw people out to cast ballots. There are a lot of cl very close, hard-fought elections in this period, governor's races, Senate races, and others. We just had one where the winner was declared at 1.30 in the morning by 30,000 votes, 1% margin. Uh, that happens here, and it does not happen in many other states. Lots of other states have trended such that their politics are either reliably blue or reliably red, and the statewide elections are just not that competitive or that compelling. Not true in purple Wisconsin. The other thing that's happening is back in the 90s, we had governor's races that were really uninteresting because Tommy Thompson seemed to be governor for life. He was winning repeatedly and by large margins, sometimes winning almost every county in the state. So things have changed. We're no longer in the Thompson era, obviously, and hard-fought elections uh, just have generated lots of interest. So here's Wisconsin turnout in 2018. It's about 61%. I think that puts us at about third or fourth in the country. I want to give you some perspective for how high that number is. Here are turnout rates in the states. Here they are, states are lined up here. In the presidential election of 2016. The presidential election two years ago. So there's variation. There are some states down here like Hawaii, West Virginia, Tennessee, Texas, a lot of southern states, Arkansas, which have pretty low turnout rates, 40%, 50%. And there are states at the other end, like Minnesota, Maine, Wisconsin, Colorado, with very high turnout rates, exceeding 70%. Here's Wisconsin in this year's midterm election, right, 61%. The turnout rate in Wisconsin this year was higher than half of the state's presidential turnout two years ago. Right, that is a consequence of being in these lopsided states. Again, the ones who are down here, Hawaii, West Virginia, Tennessee, Texas, Oklahoma, we can't say any of those are swing states. Right? Those are mostly red states, but some reliably blue states mixed in. Whereas at the other end, you've got New Hampshire and Maine and Colorado and Wisconsin, all the interesting places. Right? Okay, so pretty remarkable. So I, I think in terms of the blue wave we were expecting, this year was not so exceptional. It doesn't look very different from other elections. But in terms of turnout, this year was incredible. It just looks nothing like uh, really any election we've seen in our lifetimes. All right, so that's agenda item two. Let's talk about agenda item three. Wisconsin governor's race. Wisconsin governor's race. How many of you were up till 1.30 in the morning when the Milwaukee ballots came in? Evers finally took the stage. Yeah, it's fun. You never know what you're gonna get on election night. Uh, that's what we got this year. Uh, I mentioned already that Democrats had a good year generally in Wisconsin, winning all of the statewide races. That was the first time they had done that since the 80s. Uh, but that success stopped when it got to the state legislature for reasons we mentioned. This was the marquee matchup. It got a lot of national attention. I had lots of reporters, documentary filmmakers, all kinds of people, reporters from other countries, spending time in Wisconsin to watch this race. A few things about it you may not have thought of. Uh, one is this ends a really exceptional period in Wisconsin politics. Eight years, essentially uninterrupted, of a Republican governor, a Republican assembly, and a Republican Senate. There was a little blip for six months in the state Senate after a recall election where Democrats had power for a few months. Set that one aside. Essentially, it's been eight years of Republican control. That does not happen in Wisconsin. Again, this is a competitive state, so you wouldn't expect that to happen. You have to go back to the 1950s to find another era this long when one party, either Democrat or Republican, controls the state. So what we're doing in 2019 is returning to normal Wisconsin politics in a way, which is divided government. One party in the governor's office, one party in the state legislature. We know how to do that. Now, this will be a different kind of party in the state legislature than Democratic governors in the past faced. Both parties have moved away from the center, 
So the Republicans in the legislature today are more conservative than, say, the Tommy Thompson style of Republicans that uh, you might have known in the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, but nonetheless, divided government. Uh, this is the group that essentially will deal with the next round of redistricting. It will happen after the 2020 census. So 2021 would be the time to draw the new maps. It's possible that Democrats could make some gains in the Assembly or State Senate two years from now. It seems unlikely they're going to win back both of those chambers. If they couldn't do it in a pseudo blue wave year, they're probably not going to do it in 2020. Uh, so we probably have divided government. Uh, we've also done that. In fact, aside from the 2011 maps that were put in place, every redistricting going back to the 1970s was done under divided government. And in all of those cases, the parties could not agree on what maps to produce. And it got litigated, and the courts ended up imposing the maps. So that would be my expectation for what happens this year. Uh, failure to cooperate, lawsuits, and then a judge. <laughs> that may be the process. It's possible that there's some interest in producing a kind of nonpartisan or bipartisan commission to do redistricting. Uh, Speaker of the Assembly doesn't seem keen on that, so I don't think that's going to happen right away. Um, but strange things happen when you have divided government. So Scott Walker loses after winning three statewide elections here. How do we explain that? I explain it in part simply by timing. So first of all, Scott Walker is a terrific candidate. He is on message. He is disciplined. He's telegenic. He's good with cameras. He raises a lot of money. He has a great team of people working with him. He's won three statewide elections. He knows how to do this. So I think because of those reasons, he gets the benefit of the doubt going into an election, even in a year which is difficult. At the same time, if you look back at his career in politics, many of his elections have happened in environments that have been good for his party. His last election was in 2014. That was a kind of wave election that was good for the GOP. The recall election I sort of set aside as an oddity. It happened in a strange time in the summer of 2012. There were lots of even Democratic voters who didn't like Scott Walker who nonetheless voted for him or didn't vote, saying they didn't believe in the recall process. So I think that's just kind of a different entity. So you have 2014. 2010, when he was first elected, was a great year for Republicans. That was the big wave that went against Obama. But even if you go back into his earlier career as Milwaukee County Executive, to some degree as his time in the state legislature, he often ran in environments where the Republicans had a tailwind. 2018 is suddenly a test of whether he can make it in a year when there's a headwind, when, the, when there, he is fearing a blue wave. Uh, and he didn't quite do it. But he came close. One percentage point, he came close. And I think that's a testament to his quality as a candidate. Whether you like him or dislike him, he's good at running for office and has a great set of people helping him. Uh, but in this environment, with this opponent, and all the things that were going on, it just wasn't quite enough for him. The other thing that's happening, I think, is that the coalition who support Republican candidates has evolved somewhat since Trump won the state two years ago. Walker put together a, a successful, tight coalition of voters that included a home base in Waukesha County and the sub other suburban counties that ring around Milwaukee, the so-called WOW counties. That was the headquarters, still is the headquarters for the Republican Party in Wisconsin. But also winning lots of rural communities, building up strength in the kind of corridor that runs from the Fox Valley, Brown County, on down to Milwaukee, those places like Sheboygan, Appleton, and so on. A lot of success there. That was a coalition that was a formula for success for him. And what Democrats had were two big cities, essentially, and that didn't work for them. But that has evolved uh, because Trump won the state in a different way. Trump actually struggled in the suburban counties outside Milwaukee. That was the headquarters for the Never Trump movement. Charlie Sykes and other conservatives who were saying, this is not the person we want representing our party, that message was going out to voters in places like Waukesha. And, and many of them didn't vote for him. His vote share was about three or four percentage points lower there than for other Republicans on the ballot at the same time. And it looks like they have not quite come back to the Republican Party in the same way. But where Trump picked up votes was in rural communities, especially along the Mississippi River in the western part of the state. Those were places that had been reliably Democratic, some of those counties, like Little Pepin County, had voted for a Democrat in every presidential election from 1972 until 2016. Okay, so there's this kind of hybrid Republican Party now that's somewhere between Walker's coalition and Trump's coalition. So I'm going to show you that in just a second. But I also want to highlight that Democrats turned out 
in 2018 in a way they had not in Walker's other elections, right? And that, uh, that contributed, obviously, to Walker's loss. Um, so let me give you a sense of how Walker's coalition has changed. Uh, this is his last election in 2014 when he was reelected. Those are supposed to be red and blue. Uh, this was a few weeks ago. So he's the Republican on the ballot in both cases. The maps look similar. You're going to recognize there are blue places like Dane County. There are red places like Waukesha County. There are some other blue places like these very northern, you know, Bayfield, Ashland kinds of places. Um, and there are places like Rock County and others that tend to be blue as well. But there's some differences too. One is that the places that were blue mostly got bluer. So here's Dane County. It's lit up even brighter blue. Look at the margins here. You know, if you can win 70 or 80 percent in a high turnout county, very helpful to Democrats. Even Milwaukee County gets bluer. But some of these red places actually get redder. Up here, look at these places. They're mildly red. You know, he won maybe 60 percent of the vote, 70 percent of the vote in some of these counties. They actually become stronger for Walker in 2018, despite his loss. <coughs> There are a few little flips. So here are the blue counties that used to be, at least used to be blue. Walker picked off some of those in 2014. They started coming back a little bit in 2018. And you also had a flip down here that came back. These are very close. These are highly competitive Kenosha and Racine counties. So a little bit of movement. So I think Walker was stuck to some degree between these two coalitions, and neither one quite did it for him. So uh, part of his trouble this time around was that that the Trump had reshuffled the Republican deck a little bit in a way that didn't quite fit with the message that Walker usually offered. The other was that Democratic bases, the core Democratic voters in the state, showed up. As, as a campaign consultant would put it, they performed, or maybe outperformed our expectations. So here's a graphic that was on Madison.com right after the election. Uh, it's sort of the story you would tell of any election in Wisconsin, <laughs> but. Um, I think told the story of this one pretty well. Each of those circles is a county in Wisconsin. The size of the circle indicates how many people cast ballots. There are two places that Democrats go to get a lot of votes. You know what they are. Uh, this is a risky strategy for Democrats. Uh, Evers, in, even in his success, got over a third of his total votes from just two counties. If I were a financial advisor, I would not recommend to someone an investment of this type to put all your eggs in two baskets, but it's where Democrats are. Republicans have a different uh, kind of order supporting them. So Waukesha County is sort of the home, a high turnout county and a large population county, but you put together lots of other counties. So whereas Evers got a third of his vote from just two counties, um, Walker got a third of his vote from six counties. So it's a more diversified portfolio. Now, it didn't work for him this time around, um, but it, it does usually for Republicans. So what happened this year to, to make that, that dynamic go in a different direction? One way to think about it is the big counties versus the little counties, the ones with large populations versus small. That was not the way that politics usually worked, because some of the big ones were actually good Republican counties, like Waukesha, and some were good Democratic counties, like Dane. Uh, and that is still true. But there seems to be something of a revolt going on in the large population counties against Republicans, and some enthusiasm actually going up in some of the smaller counties. So let me explain this one to you. So each circle here is a county. Again, the bigger the circle is, the more votes were cast in the county. Here's how Walker did in 2014, four years ago. Here's how he did in 2018. So if he did exactly the same, if he got 30% of the vote one year and 30% in the next election, that circle would be right on that line. So here's Dane County, not fans of Scott Walker. He gets uh, in the 30% range in 2014, but less in 2018. So that circle is below the line, right? And that's mainly because Democrats turned out at a higher rate. Seems true in Milwaukee County. That circle is big and it's below the line. So there are the two biggies. You saw that in the previous graphic. But look up here, here are the Republican counties where he gets a very high share of the vote, 70 or 75% of the vote. All of these more populated Republican counties, Waukesha, Washington, Ozaki, the Wow counties, are below the line. He earned a smaller share of the vote in 2018 than he did in 2014 in these hardcore Republican counties. But they were also counties, again, who turned against Trump, and so I think 
there's some hesitation about, for these voters about their own party. Uh, but truth be told, most of this decline below the line is actually Democrats showing up in places like Waukesha and keeping Walker's margins down. Walker got about as many votes in Waukesha this time as he did four years ago, but there were many more Democrats, so his share of the vote goes down. But look at all these little tiny counties. They liked him more in 2018 than they did in 2014. Those are above the line. Those are Trump counties. Those are rural places north and west in the state mostly who were enthusiastic about Trump and have now moved into the Republican camp, even if the candidate's not Trump, even if Walker is on the ballot rather than Trump. Uh, they are there, and these more educated, higher income suburban Republican counties are showing a little bit of reluctance, plus having Democrats biting at their heels. I'm going to show you one more way to look at this that I think is telling. Here are the counties arrayed in 2014. This is Walker's last election, alphabetically. And this is the margin he got in each of those counties. So a positive number means that Walker got more votes than his opponent, Mary Burke, did. A negative number means he got less, that Burke uh, outpolled him. You can't read these, but you don't have to because you know what these two spikes are. <laughs> Here's Dane. So Walker got 100,000 margin uh, loss in Dane County and about the same in Milwaukee. So he starts out 200,000 votes down in building the statewide vote in 2014. Here's Waukesha. Doesn't give him quite as much. It's almost 100,000 in his favor. But it doesn't make up for Dane and Milwaukee. But what makes up are all these other counties, most of which are to the right of the line, right, or in his favor. So this is 2014. That's, that's the Re Republican coalition that Walker assembled. Now I'm going to show you the same picture for 2018. OK, I'll just go back and forth. There's 2014. Just watch all the lines jump to the left. So you can see Dana and Milwaukee, they go from giving uh, Burke 100,000 vote margins to giving Evers 150,000 vote margins. So automatically there, Evers picks up about another 100,000 votes over Burke. Actually, that would have been enough for Burke to win. She lost by about 100,000 votes. Uh, but look even at Waukesha down there in the lower right. It goes from being strongly supportive, really delivering for Walker, to not so much. Right? There's still a lot of Republican votes there. There's actually a lot of Democratic votes there, too. For both parties, the top three counties for votes are Dane, Milwaukee, and Waukesha. So even though they have different partisan flavorings, there are just a lot of people in those places, and that's why the bars jump out. So you're going to have trouble winning an election when this shift takes place. Right? So Dane County and Milwaukee really made it happen. Uh, this is in part because Democratic voters became even more Democratic. I'll just show you a little evidence of this. This is from the exit polls, which interview people as they're leaving the polling place. I actually got to do an exit poll for the first time in my life after voting this year. There's a pollster waiting there asking me these very questions. So I'm one of the data points in this table. I won't tell you which one. So here's 2014. Uh, this is Mary Burke and Scott Walker. This is different age groups. You can see that Walker won all of the age groups except for the youngest vote, which Burke just won, 51-47. You're going to lose elections. If, that's, if you lose all the age groups but young people, you're going to lose elections. Here's 2018. Now Walker is winning those older age groups by about the same amounts, 52 or 53 percent. But now he's getting killed among young voters. Evers got 60 percent of the vote compared to Burke's 50 percent of the vote. It's a huge change in four years. Uh, but he's also losing among the 30 to 44s, who had been pretty reliable for Walker in the past. Now, these are different people. They're four years older than they were back here. So some of them have migrated up from one part of the table to another. Uh, but that's a 14-point difference in favor of Evers among the 30 to 44s. So this ought to be a little bit troubling if you're a Republican thinking about the future. As these groups age and become a larger part of the Wisconsin electorate, you're going to have some challenges as older voters, who are your core supporters, begin to move out of the electorate. Um, so that's one thing that happens. Blue voters became bluer this time around. Another is the division between uh, people living in different kinds of places. So here we have urban, suburban, and rural voters. In 2014, Burke won the urban voters. Now, surprisingly, that's Dana and Milwaukee counties. I just showed you those uh, in some college towns. Walker kills every place else. So she gets about 6 out of 10 votes in urban places. He gets about 6 out of 10 in the suburbs and rural communities. But look what happens in 2018. Evers gets 75% of the vote in cities. You don't win 75% of the vote anywhere. 
Uh, and Walker's share in the suburbs and rural areas stays about the same. So again, Republicans look about like they did four years ago, but Democrats changed. Right, so you tell me young and urban, what part of the state is that? I think we're in it. Right? This is a place that really performed for the Democrats. Uh, there are some interesting differences I don't quite know what to do with just yet. And one is differences among educational levels. So here's 2014. Walker wins all of these educational groups except for the eggheads who have postgraduate degrees. <laughs> right? there, uh, Burke wins 60% of the vote, but there are not very many of those types. But in 2018, it's more complicated. Evers is winning those, the highly educated group just the way Burke did, but he's also winning people who just have college degrees, and there are a lot of them. Uh, he's actually winning some people who have some college, or at least that's a tie, and there just aren't many categories. People with high school degrees only, essentially, Walker does best with, and people who've done a little bit of college have an associate's degree. All right? This is partly what's been happening under Trump, that educated suburban voters who had been with the Republican Party because they supported its social positions and its positions on taxes, are reluctant about Trump. Think of this as the Waukesha family. And they're in these categories, right, up here. And they've just been moving away from the party to some degree. Walker paid a price for that. OK, there was a suggestion uh, before the last presidential election that the upper Midwest had become something of a blue wall that would protect Democratic candidates running for president. We know the states in the eastern coast, you know, places like Massachusetts and New York, reliably Democratic. States on the west coast like California, Washington, Oregon, very Democratic. But this new coast, like along the Great Lakes, had become Democratic. And states like Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, maybe Pennsylvania, had become pretty reliably Democratic. And so it seemed impossible that a Democratic candidate could not win the Electoral College for that reason. Well, we know that was wrong. Uh, and I think, well, I won't toot my horn here, but I think some people saw that the blue wall was not quite what people had built it up to be. Think about Wisconsin's role in this. Wisconsin had voted for a Democratic presidential candidate in every presidential election from 1988 until Trump. That was seven consecutive presidential elections a Democrat won the state. That's quite a record. There actually aren't a lot of states that have that record. But a lot of those elections turned out to be really close. A Democrat won, but just barely. And it also turns out that a lot of those elections had Democrats win the national vote. So it was not so surprising that that person would also win the vote in Wisconsin. So here are those seven elections. And here's the margin that the Democratic candidate won by in each of those races. So here's 88, Mike Dukakis wins, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton wins bigger. Here's Bush won, barely loses the state, Bush two barely loses the state. So we're going to count those as Democratic victories, but they're basically ties. I think one of these is 11,000 votes statewide, and the other is 18,000 votes, something like that. Even narrower than Evers win a couple weeks ago. Here's Obama's victory uh, coming back in 2012. And here's the only Republican victory in the set. But it, too, is basically a 50-50. It is remarkable that someone like Donald Trump could win the state when other Republicans like Mitt Romney or John McCain or George Bush, could not win the state. So there's something that's still for us to understand there. But the truth is, that pattern of seven in a row is not quite as remarkable when you look at this at, at this way. And when we put it alongside the US, so here's the margin nationwide, of these seven elections, five of them, Democrats won the popular vote. So five out of seven nationally, it's seven out of seven in Wisconsin, but just barely in a couple of those cases. Right, Wisconsin's pretty much in line with the rest of the country. We notice those lines kind of rise and fall together. Okay, so they're probably, and this would be true of the other Midwestern states as well. Michigan looks a little this way, Pennsylvania a little this way. Democratic, but just by the skin of their teeth. So if you like living in a swing state, don't move. This is going to be the place where people like to go. We've now had a presidential race won by less than a percentage point, and a governor's race won by just more than a percentage point in a period of two years. Wisconsin is very likely to be at the top of the list of states that get attention in the 2020 presidential election. Here's one analysis done by Craig Gilbert at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He looked at three presidential elections, 2000, 2004, 2016. He took out the two Obama elections 
as being somewhat exceptional and keeping these, as, keeping these in as being basically 50-50 elections. These were all very close. Of those, Wisconsin, uh, among these three elections, Wisconsin is the state that has the closest overall margin across those three elections. There's no other state that's more competitive. Okay, so yes, there's sort of a blue wall here. Pennsylvania's in that group too, and so is Minnesota, and there's Michigan and Iowa. All of these states are up for grabs, and Wisconsin's at the top of the list. Okay, let me make uh, just a couple of uh, quick plugs, and then I'm happy to take all the questions you have. Uh, one is if you like this kind of analysis, we have a center on campus that does this called the Elections Research Center. I'm the director of that center. We have a website. If you just want to follow us on social media and get the research and events that are coming up, that's a good way to do it. We do, in fact, have a big event coming up just next week, and you're lucky there's still time to sign up if you want to come. This is a symposium that we put on after every federal election. It'll be next Friday the 7th, all day at the Discovery Building right across the street, wherever that is, and it will involve a series of presentations and discussions from researchers like me, from pollsters, from journalists, and others. So if you want to visit our website and have a look at the schedule and register, do that in the next couple days because we're just about to shut down registration at the end of the week. It is, it is free to attend. Uh, one other thing I'd be happy to talk about if you're interested is something called the Big Ten Voting Challenge. Uh, you may have heard about this. This was a competition among the Big Ten universities this year that all presidents and chancellors at those 14 schools signed on to to boost student turnout. I was the faculty lead of the group on our campus. Uh, we don't know the results of that competition yet. I can tell you why. But I, we also I think we had a lot of success, and I'd be happy to talk about some of the indicators and things we did if you have questions there. So let me stop with that, and I'd be delighted to have questions. Yes, sir. What factors do you think contributed to the much larger Democratic voter turnout in the 2018 election than in the previous, in the, in the 2016 election? So the question is, why did Democrats turn out hot more in 2018 than other elections? Uh, I think there are a few things going on. One is anger about 2016, just surprise. And um, I, I think a realization that that election mattered more than Democrats realized at the time. There were serious consequences of Trump rather than Clinton winning, and those were felt by Democrats really emotionally, and so I think they were looking for, for outlets. Some of those outlets were things like the Women's March in Washington, or the March on Science, or others, uh, but voting was sort of the ultimate way to express that. Um, the other, I think, is just watching Trump govern in office, and there was a sense that this was the way to keep him in check, right? You can't, he's, he said at one point he was on the ballot. He said at another point he was not on the ballot. He was certainly on people's minds as they were casting their ballots. So this is a way to sort of put, put the brakes on, as the New York Times put it, put the brakes on the Trump agenda to some degree. Uh, Democrats were really enthused in every poll that I saw through election season, more than we had seen in other elections, uh, even in some presidential elections, just more Democrats telling us they were excited to vote, they intended to vote. Republicans were not at that same level through most of the campaign. They were at a high level, actually higher than Republicans normally are. So they were not demoralized. They were just not at the same atmospheric level that Democrats were. That began to change in the last couple weeks of the campaign. Some people attribute that to the Kavanaugh hearings as maybe juicing up Republican voters, getting them excited and reminding them what they were getting from having Trump in the White House. They were getting people on the Supreme Court and other judges. There's probably some truth to that, especially in some red states where there were Senate seats. Um, but whatever the reason, there, there was definitely movement upward on the Republican side as well. So they didn't quite match Democrats in the end, but the truth is both sides were incredibly energized. That's the only way you get turnout like that, is to have both sides participating at very high rates. Yes? You mentioned for the, uh, you know, the turnout, when you talked about I mean, the governor's race, the young, the urban, the higher educated. What about the female factor? I didn't see anything mentioned about the female participation or how they yeah. what do you think about the female? Factor? You know, uh, the, the female factor is huge in 2018. Uh, some people are calling it the year of the woman too, after the year of the woman won back in 1992. Huge number of women running for office around the country, record number of women running for office, record number of win women winning office by a lot. Actually, I can show you that. And then I'm going to come back to, uh, to women voters. 
This is the number of women running for Congress, running for the House. You can see the year the woman won, back in 1992, suddenly there are more women running that year. That also was after a uh, contentious Supreme Court nomination, <laughs> um, maybe not coincidentally. So a big jump there. But it's all on one side. It's all Democrats. Before that, if you were a woman running for Congress, you were, it was equally likely that you were a Democrat or a Republican. After 1992, it's now two to one. Look what happens in 2018. There are 182 women running for a Congress. Uh, that's, what, four to one in terms of number of Republicans. So uh, things are pretty different. Um, here's the number who won. There are now over 100 Democratic women in Congress. The number of Republican women actually went down in 2018. So it was the year of the woman, but only on one side of the aisle. Um, one more way of looking at this. Here are the new Republicans in the House. Those are the freshmen coming into the House of Representatives in January. They'll be sworn in. I see two female faces, one in the Senate, one in the House. And uh, no people who are not white. There are the Democrats. There's more of them. Democrats had a good year. I think they're a majority female and a lot of people of color. The party's demographic bases are changing. They're, they don't look like each other anymore. And that trickles down and you know, creates a, a gender gap. Um, I was surprised that the gender gap was not bigger in 2018. I've looked at the exit polls, like the ones I showed you in Wisconsin. Women did not move strongly away from Walker from where they were in 2014. I, I expected that they were, especially the suburban women who were put off by Trump and things happening in Washington, that they might be more interested in Evers. Uh, they were not. But men, surprisingly, in Wisconsin looked like they moved away from Walker. And that was part of what was going on. Now, they tend to be younger, educated men, you know, in Dane County, those kinds of places. Um, but I don't think the gender gap was bigger in Wisconsin, as I recall, this time around. So that was surprising. But nationwide is very, obviously very important. Women turned out at high rates. Uh, African American women, in particular, have been really a key constituency for Democratic candidates. And they showed up again as well in 2018. So it's an important factor to watch, but kind of mysterious what happened here in Wisconsin. Yes? In 2010, we had Citizens United. From a bigger picture perspective, since that decision, the, the, the short, the, the smaller margins or the more content, has, can, is, there, is there a Citizen United effect on how close the races are? Um, is anybody, I presume, looking at that? Hmm. I, I couldn't, I couldn't see yeah. that together as fast. Yeah, I haven't sewn those two things together. So the question's about Citizens United, a Supreme Court case. It was part of a series of cases that opened up new kinds of spending by independent groups who could spend directly on elections, directly on candidates, as long as they didn't coordinate with those candidates. Yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of opened up dark money as well, 501c and 501c3 and 501c4 groups, who are even more secretive. At least the PACs and the super PACs report to the FEC. The 501c groups do not because they are social welfare groups under the IRS tax code. Uh, I have not linked that change in campaign finance to elections being closer. I don't know that they are linked. They might feed off one another in a way, but we certainly had close elections before Citizens United. I think back to the 2000 presidential election where we were still counting votes in Florida at this time uh, and litigating it. Uh, that took 37 days. And there are bits of other, the Franken race in Minnesota, so there are bits of other very tight ones. Um, but it may be that the financiers of politics are now more nimble because the election laws let them be more nimble and they can dump money into places where they think it's going to be more impactful. What we're seeing, for example, is national groups, uh, kind of fly-by-night groups that get created just for the purpose of one election cycle, going into state legislative races where it used to be a few thousand bucks and making signs and knocking on doors was enough to win a race. And now they're spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases over a million dollars for a state legislative seat. Uh, not in big, expensive states like California, but in but, you know, modest states like Ohio and Minnesota. So that's one place we've seen it, I think. They, they have a sense that the money just gets them more in you know, a small district like that where not very much money can help you buy a seat more easily. Other questions? Yes? How do you feel uh, Wisconsin's more restrictive registration requirements and ID requirements have affected turnout and outcome? 
Good question. Uh, this question is about voter ID requirements and registration requirements. Uh, I would separate those. Uh, there has been some tightening of the registration laws, like the residency requirement is a little tighter. But mostly, we still have pretty forgiving voter registration rules. We're one of the states with same-day voter registration. It's pretty heavily used, especially in student wards around campus. Um, so there, I don't think there's been as much change. Uh, the voter ID law was a big change, because that went from a system where voters essentially showed up and said their name and were given a ballot. Uh, if they were registered or they, they could become registered on the spot to now having one of the strictest laws in the country where a, a set of five or six IDs is acceptable and nothing else. Uh, full disclosure, I was an expert witness in the federal trial around the voter ID case and a subsequent one that was litigating some pieces of it. Uh, I was working for the plaintiffs, so I was not happy about the voter ID law. Um, so 2016 would have been the first election where it was in place in a general election because it was on hold in the courts for five years as people went back and forth about that law. So I think it had an effect. I, uh, it certainly had an effect on voter turnout. We know there are people who don't have the IDs. Something like five, or five to 10 percent of the Wisconsin registered population does not have the kind of ID that's permitted by the law. Uh, and we know the people who don't have those IDs tend to be of certain demographic groups. They tend to be younger, tend to be lower income, tend to be black or Latino, tend to be in urban areas, uh, and, and to some degree older, actually. So those are the groups that are more vulnerable. Those groups tend to lean democratic. So if there's a disenfranchisement or vote suppression effect, it should affect democratic candidates. It should do more harm to their vote than to Republicans. Um, I think there was a perfect storm in 2016 because the Democratic candidate for president, who normally would have put a campaign in place on the ground in the state to help people navigate this new burden, didn't do that. The Clinton campaign, as you probably know, wasn't really present in the state the way that Obama's campaigns had been. She famously didn't visit the state. She was the first general election candidate not to visit Wisconsin since 1972, which was Nixon's landslide. I don't know how far back before that. So pretty unusual. But also she just didn't invest in a field operation and volunteers and paid advertising basically didn't exist. There weren't very many paid staffers. She just felt confident about Wisconsin, I think, and was dabbling in some other places. Um, so I think that made the voter ID law more impactful because had there been an Obama-like campaign in the state with a real aggressive grassroots operation, part of their charge would have been to help people navigate the new voter ID requirement. But what we had was a new requirement that went into place without a Democratic campaign that had an, an interest and in, invested in helping people navigate it. And the state, which was obligated to do public education around the law, didn't end up doing it. They, they created the advertising for it when the law was passed, then there were lawsuits for a number of years. Uh, they were supposed to allocate some hundreds of thousands of dollars for public education. Then when it went into effect in 2016, the money for the education didn't materialize. That was in a budget from some years ago and never came back. So there were ads that were sitting, waiting to be used. Um, some places like Milwaukee County or Milwaukee City ran the ads voluntarily in movie theaters in some parts of the city. Some other you know, radio stations would run them for free as PSAs but there wasn't the kind of public education you'd normally expect. Uh, everyone wants to know what the effect was. How many votes did it cost the Democrats or how much did it affect voter turnout? One answer to that is a study that my colleague Ken Mayer did after the election. He worked with the Dane County clerk to do a study of non-voters in the 2016 election. Uh, you can find this study on the Election Research Center's website if you're interested. Uh, their methodology was to do a survey of people in Dane and Milwaukee counties who were registered, so they took the initiative to get on the rolls, they were eligible <coughs> voters, didn't vote in 2016, sent them a mail survey and asked them a bunch of questions. Among the questions were, why didn't you vote? <laughs> and we, we, do, we ask those questions to people all the time. Um, the list of reasons you might not vote include usual suspects, like I was sick, I was not interested in the candidates, uh, I didn't feel like it, uh, I didn't have time. Th those are the popular answers. Actually, didn't like the candidates is the number one answer, always. But on the list was voter ID. And it was pretty far down. It was near the bottom in terms of popularity. But it wasn't zero. And their estimate was that something like five to 10 to 15,000 people in Dane and Milwaukee County 
would have been deterred or dissuaded in some way by the voter ID law. For some of them, it was the main reason they didn't vote, but for some of them, it was just a contributing factor, along with they were sick and didn't like the candidates, and voter ID was a factor. So it's hard to say exactly, but that was their ballpark estimate. They also ask in their survey what people knew about the voter ID law. Did they know it was in effect? Did they know what kinds of IDs were acceptable, that a, that a passport was, or an, an employee, or bus pass, or something else was not? And there was a lot of confusion, actually. There were people in their survey who had ID that made them eligible to vote, but didn't think it qualified under the law. And there were people the other way around who didn't have ID, but thought they would be fine if they went to the polls. So there's misinformation running in both directions. At the university, you may know that the students all get an ID card uh, from the UW-Madison, but it doesn't qualify as an ID for voting purposes. So the university has offered a second ID that students can pick up just for voting purposes. Uh, and we kept track of that as part of the Big Ten voting challenge. Uh, we, so we, the WISCARD office issues those IDs all throughout the year, including to freshmen when they arrive on campus in the summer. And then they're stationed at all seven uh, or eight of the polling places on campus on election day with little machines that can generate IDs on the spot. The campus actually gave out more IDs to students in this election than they did two years ago in the presidential election. I don't know what to do with that, but <laughs> there's clearly a need among students to get the ID, and they made heavy use of it this year. So it's a really complicated picture, um, but it's part of the story of Wisconsin elections now. <coughs> Chad. Sorry, I, so I have a question. You talked about uh, how, given the, the return to divided government, uh, redistricting and um, after 2020 is likely to end up in the courts. And um, I'm not quite sure how to formulate this question, but uh, I, I worry that with the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court with having a sort of conservative majority now, um, that will not, um, that, 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 will, that will advantage one party over the other. Yeah. And so the outcome might be different from previous instances of divided government where the question ended up in the courts. What's your take on that? Do you think there's, do you think it's likely to be different? Or do you think that that, that worry of mine is maybe a little no, I think you're exactly right. The, the legislature has a different makeup now than it had in the past. The parties are more different from one another, more at each other than they had been in the past. And the court is that way. They literally are at each other in some cases. And just much more polarized. So you, you don't have a kind of core group of justices willing to work together. And um, So the response of the court this time around might be different. Now, there may be different courts involved in different places. So there are three sets of maps to be drawn. You have to draw the 99 assembly districts, the 33 senate districts, and then the eight congressional districts, assuming we still have eight after the fact. So those could go to different courts. I think the assembly and the state senate would probably see a lawsuit before the state supreme court at some point. Uh, and you may be right, the conservative justices might be disinclined to buy the arguments from Democratic plaintiffs, if that's who's filing the suit. But in federal court, we don't know. You know what, there may be some venue shopping to look for a friendly court. I don't know. Um, it's a great question. Can I ask you a follow-up question? The, the states that have nonpartisan methods of districting, and you mentioned a couple, I'm curious to know how, how those methods were established given that the legislature presumably never has an interest in doing that uh, yeah. because the party that's in power wouldn't would see this thing. Yeah, so most states that have these commissions for drawing districts got them because the voters passed it in an initiative on the ballot. And most of them are not nonpartisan. They are bipartisan or tripartisan. So California and Arizona are two prime examples. They have citizens commissions where citizens can apply to be on the commission to draw the maps. California got thousands of applications. They take a specific number of Republicans, Democrats, and independents. It has to be a mixture of the three. And then a super majority of that group has to vote to approve the maps. So you have to have both Republican and Democratic votes to approve the maps. Michigan just approved this a couple weeks ago. Its voters did. So they're going to have this tripartisan commission as well. The one exception to this is Iowa. So Iowa does not have a bipartisan commission. It has no commission at all. It has a state agency that already exists, that knows how to make maps, something like our Legislative Reference Bureau, say. And when it's time to draw maps, they give the census data to this agency and ask them to produce them. And they say, by the way, so produce maps for us. And by the way, don't look at the partisanship of voting districts. And don't look at where the incumbents live. Don't try to protect them or harm them. And send the maps to the state legislature. And they do this, and the legislature has to vote it up or down, no amendments. They've been doing this for 40 or 50 years now. That was not passed by ballot initiative. That was the legislature actually imposing it on itself. 
And it was partly, I think, out of fear of being sued over another voting rights case that was happening at the same time. But actually, both parties in Iowa today would say they're pretty happy with the process. It's amazingly efficient. It's done in a couple of months. It's cheap. There's never a lawsuit. <laughs> it just has a lot of appeal. There have been bills in the Wisconsin state legislature to adopt the Iowa model. Uh, Democrats are now on board with doing this. They were not on board when they were still in power back in 2006, 7, 8. Uh, they apparently thought they were going to be in power forever and were not interested in nonpartisan redistricting, even though there were a few Democrats who were pushing the charge. Now they've gotten religion and are interested in doing that. <laughs> so um, that's a sad reason to come on board, but we welcome them. And I, you know, if Iowa can do it, we can as well. Uh, people will say, well, look, Iowa is an easy place to draw maps. There aren't any big cities. There aren't large minority populations. You don't have Voting Rights Act concerns about representing blacks and Latinos in a significant way. It only has four congressional districts. They, they literally just draw the map in quadrants, essentially, and create them. The counties are all little squares that are easy to put together as Legos. So you put Iowa in, you get Iowa out. It's just not that difficult. Uh, and that's true. It would be more challenging for an agency like that to work in Wisconsin. But we know it's possible. When this litigation was happening around the Gilvey Whitford case in Wisconsin, uh, some writers for the Isthmus drew alternative maps that show you could produce nicer looking districts that had more partisan balance to them. Uh, some of the expert witnesses, including my colleague Ken Mayer in the Wisconsin case, drew demonstration maps showing it's entirely possible to draw maps that don't divide communities as much, have nicer looking districts, have more partisan fairness in them. So I think it would be more challenging here than in Iowa, but not impossible. And hopefully whoever's in charge of the state government will have a look at the Iowa model. If they want to save money and avoid litigation, that would be the way to go. Tom. Okay, this is a more um, global sort of question because you talked about Wisconsin a lot. At the end, how worried are you, if you are worried? Um, you know, the, the Atlantic the other day, the, the two issues ago, you know, the, the end of democracy cover, and you know, the, the, a lot of hand wringing about that this. Uh, this may not just be a one-off, this may be a, a sea change in American politics, that authoritarianism, <coughs> an angry populism. Um, so there's two areas on that. One, one is that that's, that's what we're all concerned about. Another, yeah, things swing this way, they swing that way, it's sort of a pendulum model. Where, where do you see this? Yeah, so the, if you couldn't hear in the back, the questions about authoritarianism and populism and the state of democracy, essentially. Uh, I'm concerned. Uh, we're learning now how resilient our institutions are. I don't think we know the answer yet. The things I'm concerned about are attacks on the free press, uh, attacks on judges and other branches of government, incompetence in government administration. I think both liberals and conservatives should want government to work well, efficiently, effectively at a reasonable price. Uh, it's not doing that. Uh, I know people who work in different agencies in Washington. Most of them are very unhappy with the way things are going. It's just not, it's not organized. Um, you know, threats of violence against reporters or people who disagree with you. Uh, threats to do things that are not possible legally. I mean, those are, those are things we had not seen before. Actually, we'd seen them, but not from people in office. There are strains in Trump's approach that we saw in George Wallace, or Joe McCarthy, or Pat Buchanan, or Ross Perot, to be frank. But none of those people won. They all went away. Uh, and this person won. And so we're now living with it. Uh, I wish there was a stronger rebuke of what he's doing in, on those areas. You know, one way to think about it, and I think the New York Times did this, is to array Trump's actions from unusual to usual, so you know, really rare kind of activity to pretty common activity, and um, problematic to unproblematic. So we've got to pick our battles. There are things that are rare and kind of strike you as odd, but not so problematic. So the fact that the First Lady didn't move into the White House right away when he took office, that's kind of unusual. That's not been the pattern in the United States. That doesn't threaten democracy in any way. Just dismiss it. Um, those kinds of things. Uh, threatening a judge 
who is overseeing a case against a former university or, or educational operation that Trump ran because of his Mexican heritage. That's unusual and problematic. So it's things in that cell of that table that bother me. And they've not been resolved. Here we are two years in. They've not been resolved. So I don't know where this is going. Uh, there is some interesting scholarship on this. There's a recent book by two political scientists called When Democracies Die or How Democracies Die. Uh, it's a really nice look at other authoritarian regimes in places like Latin America and what lessons we learn from those from the US and what lessons don't we learn or don't apply, perhaps. So that'd be one place to look if you're thinking about these things. Uh, I wish I had better answers for you, but it's, it's worrisome, for sure. I don't want to end on that note, so we have to take, <laughs> we have to take <laughs> <laughs> Who's got an uplifting question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No one. I, I don't know if it's uplifting, but yeah, uh, I'm wondering how you would analyze people voting against certain interests. We have uh, uh, people in poor states that need Medicaid, and even in this state, where the Medicaid um, benefits weren't taken and the cost of state, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to take that federal money. And it was done out of an ideological approach. Further, you know, in a lot of the outstate red counties, uh, they're consolidated with schools, right. their roads are uh, falling apart even worse than ours are. And uh, yet, they keep voting the same way. How do you? explain that disconnect between ideology and the practical concerns people you know, would ordinarily consider in a voting group. Yeah, it, it is striking. Uh, and you hear, you know, there were people at Tea Party rallies in 2010 railing against Obamacare and the bailouts and TARP and the stimulus package, but also saying, keep your hands off my Social Security and Medicare. Right? right? And you, as, an, as a citizen, you have the freedom to kind of morselize your opinions in that way and to just put them in different boxes and be unhappy about some things <laughs> and protective of others, even if to those of us who pay a lot of attention to politics, those things don't make sense together. They don't have to make sense for the average person. So I would say it's not ideological. And that's the point in a way, that these things are sort of little boxes that you, you, know, you put away and don't think about while you're dealing with this other thing. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You showed that it had to get up to a PhD level before uh, people didn't vote for Walker. College educated people were voting for Walker. Usually, when you see the approvals for Trump, it's the college educated people that are abandoning him. And uh, it's the uneducated uh, people without college degrees. Yeah, and that's a, that's a new thing. That's a new thing that did not, well, you can see it if you look back at Walker's election in 2014. The most educated people were on Burke's side. But other than that, there weren't really differences across education levels. So this new pattern is really a Trump phenomenon. And he, and he said it in the campaign that he, what was the line? He loves the low education people or he loves the less educated people. Uh, and that, is, that has become a strong base for him and for the Republican Party. So it has changed things. Um, there's a, so there's a, there's a great study, I'll wrap with this, a study I showed my class that presented people with photos of two inauguration crowds. One was Obama's inauguration on the National Mall and one was Trump's, taken from the same vantage point. Not having labels on the pictures, you could tell that one picture had a bigger crowd than the other. When you told people, this is Obama's crowd and this is Trump's crowd, Republicans who were in this experiment would tell you the Trump picture had more people. When you didn't tell them whose crowd was bigger, whose crowd was which, they would say the one that obviously had the more people did. Uh, so they knew that what they were saying was factually incorrect, but that's not what was important. What the authors of this study concluded was that, that these Republican subjects in this experiment wanted to make a point to the interviewer to say, he's on my team, I'm on his team, and this is a way for me to support him rhetorically by standing up for what he said, which is that his crowd was the biggest ever. Now that's a kind of trivial, small, that's in this category of abnormal but not important. But it's a nice example, I think, of people expressing themselves in a, in a way that's strategic, in a way, and not so much about the facts or even their own interests. All right, so here we are on a bad note again. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for having me.